sorry David couldn't be here today. I'll try to pretend to be a security technologist, even though really I'm like a machine learning guy slash graph algorithms guy. So um, uh, just a little bit about me. Like uh, I, uh, I worked for a long time as a federal contractor for uh, Johns Hopkins. I was doing um, what we called UAVs, intelligent UAVs, but now they're called like drones and they kind of do evil things. Um, <laughs> I moved to like social network analysis, post Snowden, you all know about that. And um, so now I'm doing machine learning. Hopefully that won't turn evil because we kind of know how that turns out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a little scary. It just gets worse. So I'll tell a little, little story about um, regular expressions. I, what does that have to do with uh, machine learning, though? But, um, so who, who here has implemented uh, and optimized the non-deterministic finite automaton compiler? I, did, I think I did it in school, maybe. Yeah, but we all use it, right? We all use, uh, we use it every day. Regex, that's what Regex is built on to work, right? This is, uh, it uh, uses theories that were built in our, or, or, you know, written in the 1950s. And, uh, you know, Ken Thompson of Unix fame famously wrote, wrote them into grep and ed and all those great things. Um, well, we don't care. We don't care if it's NTM inside. Who cares? Like, you care how it works. Uh, you might need to know some of the quirks, like we were just saying uh, earlier today. Um, you know, regex can't count. If you've never seen the regex HTML page on Stack Overflow, I suggest you look at that. It's really funny. Um, you know, grep, grep really doesn't have bad cases because, it's, uh, because of the way it's written, uh, but Perl regex does, and you kind of have to know that uh, to, to know, like, when is a good time to use Perl, when is a bad time, what regexes are bad. Um, it's helpful to know how to use these things, of course. Like, what does it do? It does search in, in strings. So we don't care how it's written, um, but it's, it's built on some solid theory. So today I'm going to try to convince you, maybe, uh, to try out some machine learning algorithms. Uh, because there's been a lot of good theory built up, and it's a little bit behind regular expressions and things like that. Uh, it kind of really got going in the 70s and 80s uh, as kind of an offshoot of artificial intelligence. Uh, really picked up steam in the 2000s. And, um, you know, I originally had, how does ML work in here? Well, you guys don't care, right? So uh, what are the quirks of these machine learning techniques? Uh, how do I use this stuff easily? And, um, you know, what, what should I use it for? How can I, and how can you optimize and uh, improve our examples? So hopefully what, what you'll take away from this is, you know, a desire to, like, look at what the current libraries are and the current techniques and uh, probably and use it uh, for your own needs. It's the same way you use grep. So this is sort of a Davis slide, but uh, when, when, have you, when have you heard, like, you should review your logs every day, right? <laughs> And has anyone ever actually done that? Because, like, I mean, here's, no, you, you don't, because there's, like, billions of logs, right? Like, this is, um, wait a minute, there's, there's uh, you know, this is just one page of the logs that we took off our, off our system or, or somewhere. Um, one page of thousands, right? Like, I, can, I can't even read this up close, so. How are we supposed to analyze these things? I mean, obviously, we're going to have to use machine uh, techniques. But um, what, what I'm proposing here is that, you know, computers are good at some things, including uh, some of this machine learning stuff I'll be talking about. Uh, they're bad at context and understanding, all right? They don't know what they're talking about unless you tell them. They're good at repetition and drudgery, and uh, algorithm is cheap. So if, if, you, if you have something that works, you can just do it over and over. So people have uh, contextual analysis. They're sort of the opposite. But like, what we want to do is empower analysts to use some of these new techniques in their work to kind of give, you know, a terminator or whatever. Like someone who's like good at all these things together. Good at context, good at analysis, and agile investigations. So we got all these log records, uh, you know, how can we cut them down? Like stuff you do every day, grep. Uh, you can like kind of use your uh, expert knowledge to say, I don't, I don't care about, you know, ping messages. Well, maybe that's not a good idea as we saw earlier. So what we're proposing is like using machine learning to really cut down all these logs. That's why we're calling it clear cut. So we're going to cut down all the logs, and maybe this is a little evil, but leave them a couple of good ones behind, and just disregard the rest. So we have a, uh, what we did was uh, we wrote a little uh, uh, open source library uh, that you can use to, as an example of uh, some code that uses scikit-learn to analyze some of these HTTP logs. Um, you know, we're not saying, like, put this in production, we're not saying, like, um, you know, copy it exactly, but what we're saying is, like, use it as an example of, uh, 
of what to do and like how to do it. So I will go a little bit into this sort of like the quirks of machine learning and like what it can do for you. You kind of have to have that framework to say like, okay, what, what, what do I want to use it for? Uh, there's two general like big uh, pieces of machine learning. There's a couple more outside of this, but I'm going to focus on these two today. So it's generally broken into supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So machine learning in general is just like a computer program that like in some way adapts to the data. Well, that could almost describe every computer program out there, right? So it's kind of narrowed down a little bit into these uh, large subgroups of um, you know, learning, which is like you give it, you present the algorithm with some data, it learns something about that data, and then you can apply that knowledge to new data. All right, that's what we call learning. And there's two different types of learning here, supervised and unsupervised. And what this, what this really means is like supervised, I have um, some labeled training data. Uh, and so in the beginning, I have a bunch of data and it's labeled. So I'm, and I wanna, I wanna categorize this data into multiple categories. So something like I have pictures of cats and dogs, right? And I know which ones are which. I know this is a cat, this is a dog. Um, and I want to build an algorithm that can look at that uh, tagged data and produce an algorithm which can say, given a new picture, it would tell me if it's a cat or a dog, right? I just want to classify things. <clears throat> and we're, we're going to talk about random forests as one of the better classification algorithms out there today. Uh, there's also unsupervised learning, which is like, I just have a bunch of data. I don't know, what's, I don't know anything about it. I don't know, what, I don't know if it's a cat or a dog or a lemur or whatever. Um, I don't have labels. Um, and we want to assume something about there's some normality here. And, and, and in terms of uh, the, the data that we're talking about here, it's like attacks or malicious behavior. We're going to assume those are like rare events in this case. And what we're going to use is something called outlier detection. So we're going to train a model on like what is what's normal. We're going to just like jam a whole bunch of normal data into the algorithm and then ask it like out of this new data, what's weird? Uh, you know, what, what, what records look weird? And that's called outlier detection, and we're going to be using a, a relatively new algorithm called isolation force, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, but we're going to talk about that a little bit. You can also do clustering, which is unsupervised. So you just like throw a bunch of data at uh, a system, and it says, "Oh, I think this is a group. I think this is a group, and I think this is a group." Uh, but it can't say like what are the groups. Like it can't say this is malicious, this is uh, normal. It doesn't know things like that. It's just going to tell you group one, group two, group three. And sort of like a little bit difficult to analyze this unless you already know the answers in advance, which is like you would use supervised instead anyway. So just diving a little bit deeper into supervised learning, right? Um, we're going to focus on binary classification, which really means you only have two groups. You know, malicious, normal, dog, cat. Doesn't really matter to the machine what the two groups are. Uh, but given a population of two types of things, can I find a way in an algorithm to separate those things? So in this case, maybe you have a 2D bunch of data. It's a very simple classifier that's on the screen. We, have, uh, we want to draw a line between those two types of data. Uh, some of what I have is labeled, and that's what I use to train it. So I have some things labeled orange. I have some things labeled blue. Show me the best line that will separate those two kinds of data. Uh, so nothing's perfect. Like I don't think you might you might be able to find a line here that separates it completely, but because of this guy over here, which is a really like cat-looking dog or something, um, it's going to be hard to draw a line that gets everything exactly. So what this is going to be is like we have all this gray data now, and whenever anything is on the um, you know lower left of this line, it's going to say I think it's orange, and whenever it's on the upper right, it's going to say I think it's blue. So it's either cats or dogs, or what we're looking for is like normal behavior and malicious behavior, right? So uh, fortunately, Python and other languages have like truckload of libraries to do this sort of thing for you. It's been researched for a very long time. We know how these things behave. And um, the machine can just learn these through enough samples. And it's very good at it, you know, given you know, uh, some caveats, right? I press down. So how do you do this with random forest? So this is like how to use grep, right? Uh, what do you want to do is you identify your positive and negative sample data sets. So you, you give it, you have a bunch of data, you want to label it either malicious or not malicious. <clears throat> you want to clean and, clean and normalize this data. Um, what we usually do is partition the data into training sets and test sets and maybe validation set. 
I don't have really a whole lot of time to go into like validation, K, K way cross validation, stuff like that, but you want to keep a little bit of data back because what, what can happen is you can overfit your data on your, on your, te on your training set, and then it'll, it'll be very good at recognizing your training set, but in the real world, it'll just fail completely. Um, so you're going to select and compute some interesting features on this data. Usually, want these to be numeric. You'll train the model, so you'll uh, give that data to the to the algorithm. It'll train. You'll test it, which is that group of data that you held back from your uh, labeled set. You'll run the model on it and see what comes out. See what what gets labeled correctly, what gets labeled incorrectly. You can evaluate the results. I'll talk a little bit about that, and you know, then it's Miller time. Um, even in this case, so look, what do you do if you don't have uh, abnormal data? If you don't have malicious data, even like you can use unsupervised techniques, like I was saying before. Um, <clears throat> there's also a number of ways to generate synthetic abnormal data. So if we if we just have normal data, what we can do is, and this is in the in the code that we have, um, we can use this noise contrastive estimation. I know it's like a little bit complicated here, but we're going to generate noise data from the normal data. And what you can do, uh, like one sort of naive way to do it is just say like, okay, I have this, I have bytes transferred, for example. I'm just going to uniformly randomly generate bytes transferred. That's not as good as doing something like what this Chimera would look like, which is I take properties of the normal data and generate, you know, those columns of data in the noise, but they come from the same sort of distribution as the normal data. But they have no connection, for example, with the other columns of data. I like forget all the correlations. And so, yeah, this lion might be a normal lion face, but um, you know, it maybe came from cats, but it has a snake tail. So like, it looks weird. That log record that you generate looks weird. Uh, but it's sort of realistic-ish. So this is a, like, it's been proven to be a better way to generate synthetic abnormal data. So you can just take this synthetic data, label it as malicious, and then run it through your supervised learning algorithm. And you, you would only do, want to do this if you don't have uh, malicious data to play with. <clears throat> so a little bit about uh, uh, random forests. They're actually a pretty simple concept. Um, you, you would have a bunch of decision trees, right? So what's a decision tree? Decision tree is like a tree structure that you take your record and you ask a question about it. Um, you know, this is a, a famous example of like uh, which people survived the Titanic. So the first question you want to say about this one record, which would be a person, right? Uh, is that person a man or not? Yes or no? So if it's no, there's a good chance they survived. If it's yes, you still got to ask more questions. Um, so is their age greater than nine and a half? Um, if uh, yes, they probably died. So. This is like uh, older males died, all females lived, and maybe you know, if the number of siblings is greater than 2.5, maybe they survived. So this is great you know, once you have it, but how do you know how to build this thing, right? Um, so basically, like, the way, there's lots of ways to train these things. I'm not going to go into it too much, but <clears throat> what you can do is you can try to find the column that describes, uh, that splits the set into yes or no, or cat or dog most first and split on that set first. So great, you know, that, that works, it can produce a tree and you keep doing that recursively until you reach some threshold for, um, for accuracy. Uh, these things are prone to overfitting because you're kind of only looking at a subset of the data and you're kind of looking only at one axis at a time. So great, we can build a decision tree. What we really want to do here is do that on sort of random subsets of the data. And uh, why does this work? Um, it's sort of, uh, people don't really know entirely, but it's like the, the, the uh, wisdom of the masses. So what you can do is you can take your data set, select a bunch of random columns from it, select a bunch of random uh, rows, like some uh, random examples from your data, and then build a decision, decision tree on it. You store that decision tree, and then you repeat that process 50 times. Uh, then you have 50 decision trees. And you ask every single one of them for a new piece of data, you know, what's the outcome? Is this a cat or a dog? And what, what you do is you take either like, what you would do is take a weighted sample, or you can take a vote of the, of the 50 decision trees that you do. 
And it's been proven that this like mitigates the overfitting and things like that. Um, and it's a pretty simple idea, right? So uh, scikit-learn has, uh, you know, libraries do this really easily, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> we'll switch directions for a second to uh, outlier detection. So this is a little bit of a different problem. We don't have any labeled data here. You notice, like, before we had orange and blue, we knew something about the data. Right now, we don't know anything about the data. It's just a bunch of dots. And this, this is going to be the case a lot of times. <clears throat> so given this population, um, can I find a function that, you know, tells me which things look weird? That's outlier detection. And I have circles drawn around these things. That was sort of a clustering idea. But you can say, like, maybe this function says, I'm going to put some circles on here. Anything inside the circles is normal. Anything outside the circles is weird. So that would be a case of uh, outlier detection. So you can also pretend that this is a classifier where, you know, class zero is normal, class one is weird. And um, there's lots of different ways to accomplish this. Uh, one is just like, how far is this point to its nearest neighbor, right? If it's far away from its nearest neighbor, it's an outlier. That's one way to do it. The angle-based methods are kind of neat. So it's like, OK, if you're a planet, uh, if you're like Earth, and you look at the angles to all the other planets in the sky, uh, you're going to see the sun over here. You're going to see Mercury over here. You're going to see Venus behind you. You're kind of in the middle of things. But if you're Pluto, if you're way out there in Pluto, you're going to look at the sun. It's over there. You're going to look at Venus. It's also over there. You're going to look at the Earth. It's also over there. Everybody's confined to a narrow angle. So if you can say, like, everybody looks like it's in a narrow angle, then they're an outlier. Uh, so what, what's the issue with these things if they work fairly well? Like, you have to compare either distances or angles between pairs of things. And um, we don't like comparing pairs of things in big data, right? Like, because if you have a million things, there's a trillion pairs. That's bad. Um, so there's this kind of re relatively new thing I was talking about, isolation-based methods. And what this does is if you have a group of stuff, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of like random forests. You're going to build a tree. You're going to build a tree out of this data where you take a particular point, or you take this data set, you split it at some random, you split it along some random axis, some random column, and you see uh, if there's how many points are on one side and how many points are on the other. So if there's more than one point on one side or the other, you do this recursively until there's only one point left. So this point down here, there's only one point left in that box after you split it here, then maybe the next time you split it here, then maybe you randomly switch, uh, you switch columns and you split it this way, and then you split it this way, and then this way, and then this way. Um, what it's saying is, if you're an inlier, it takes longer to split you that way than if you're an outlier. See, this took maybe seven splits. This one only took like four splits to split out. And so this one's more outlier because it took less splits to separate from the group. Uh, what's the great thing about this? It's linear, right? Like you don't compare any pairs of anything. So this is really good for like bigger data sets. And it's actually been shown uh, you know, in this year's, uh, one of this year's conferences that this actually works better than a lot of the other well-known methods. So it's like double win. <coughs> Um, this works really well on numeric types, bytes in, bytes out. It has a serious problem with enumerated types, like it really can't do them. So that's kind of an issue. <clears throat> so that's kind of what those things do. I'm going to say a quick note about parameters. Some of these things are not parameter free, like you can't usually just plug them in, although people have done a lot of work to, uh, to have default parameters on these things that are good, good enough, right? Um, but if you do play with the parameters that are available, you can get better results. So this is a rock curve here. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if like, you guys are familiar with rock curves. Basically, they're trying to print, uh, plot a function of one variable to two variables. So the one variable is like maybe a parameter that you're, uh, you're tuning. The other two variables are false positive rate and true positive rate. And those are the, those are the things plotted along this, uh, on this plot. Um, <clears throat> so as you go along the curve, your variable is increasing, and then you plot true positive, false positive. You want to be above this line, which is, tr which is guessing, right? 
you want an excellent rock curve is one that's up against the left and top of the chart. Usually you'll see them like sort of curved above. But you know, one of our, one of our interns tested a range of parameters for uh, the iForest, which included things like number of trees, um, you know, the side, the depth of the trees, and also the parameters. And <clears throat> he was able to take this rock curve up to this better rock curve just by tweaking things. And I think most of this gain was gained by just throwing out all the, um, all the enumerated types. So, so how do we do this with that isolation for us? It looks pretty much the same. Like if you do have positive and negative sample data sets, you can use them to test. If you don't, well, you like get your model and then move on with life. It looks the same, right? Clean and normalize the data, partition the data set, and obtain training and test. Select some features, train a model, test the model, evaluate the results, mill the time. It's the same, right? So one of the beauty of uh, the libraries out there today, scikit-learn, Python, pandas, all these things, is that the gist to perform many of these types of learning are really simple, and they're also consistent amongst each other. You know, back, you know, I've been doing this kind of thing for a long time. Back in like the early 2000s, 1990s, um, if you wanted to do a machine learning t uh, technique, you basically like read the paper and implemented it yourself, or you went and downloaded the, uh, the graduate student's software and maybe it was MATLAB, who knows? Uh, and they, maybe it came with its own implementation of vectors. Nowadays, it's all, it's, you know, if you're using Scikit, it's all consistent. It's using pandas, it's using uh, you know, the pandas way of doing things. It has a consistent API. <clears throat> and I don't know if you guys can see this, but um, you know, these, are the, these are the lines of code that is, uh, that's actually doing the heavy lifting here. I'm training the random forest classifier. Um, so it does, you know, creates one using instantiation. For random forest, you have to have this uh, training set, remember? So you factor that out, that's like one line. And then you call CF, uh, CLF fit, and then predict. Isolation forest is exactly the same, except it doesn't have training data because it's unsupervised. <laughs> you create one, fit, predict. And these are the same data types that are going into it. They're pandas data frames. So by just changing like one line of code, I'm changing the way I'm doing I'm changing which, which algorithm I'm using. You know, there's like probably half a dozen supervised learning, half a dozen uh, LR detection algorithms. Use the one you like. <clears throat> so for our examples that we, we sent out there, um, we have Contagio Data uh, and our, you know, malware traffic analysis.net. Uh, we, we grabbed a bunch of HTTP uh, examples from these guys, ran them through Bro. Uh, we also have Security Onion, uh, late normal data. So this is just HTTP examples, data from our own network. So you run it through Bro, you get logs, you kind of put it in a pandas data frame, label them as malicious or not malicious, and then split it into training and test. <clears throat> Whoa, what happened? Uh, another big thing is like, what features do you want to extract to put into this thing to make it work? You know, that's kind of like asking like, what do I want to search for with grep? It's like, it's, it depends on the circumstances. What, what kind of data do you have? What's your expertise? What do you think is good to have this thing uh, uh, distinguish between malicious and normal? So some columns are already numeric. So a lot of these things want numeric data to do their analysis. Um, and some columns are already nu numeric, bytes in, bytes out. Some look numeric, but really aren't. So things like HTTP uh, you know, codes are like 400, 200. They're not really numbers. They're, it's really an enumerated type. Uh, and then there's some, like, just, right, there's some plain old strings. So like the HTTP request, the, um, the, the string of the, uh, of the user agent, all those kind of things. Um, well, how do we turn those into useful features? There's a couple ways to do it. I'm going to show one here. One way is to do this sort of bag of words techniques where we um, blow up that string or that enumerated type into n columns. The enumerated types are a little bit um, easier to explain. So like for each code, you would give it a column. And it's either 0 if that code didn't happen or 1 if that code did happen. So bang, you have like a, a, a numeric column. Um, so you can maybe see why this is not good for isolation for us, because it's going to immediately lump everything into either one or one of two things. And uh, the isolation for us just kind of like stops if everything's the same. That's not good. So it doesn't really like these kind of columns. Um, another way to do it for uh, strings is you kind of, you can break it into n-grams and then do the same bag of words trick 
with engrams. This works pretty well for random forests, not so good for isolation forests. So, you know, we, our, our script is going to like just train on a log. We have a bunch of uh, default features that we've uh, put in there. We have a bunch of default, uh, you know, a bunch of default parameters for the trees. You kind of just pass it in your malware log. This is a bro log. You pass it in your training log. This is normal data. It's going to say, um, <clears throat> it's going to read the, the bro data into pandas data frame. Each label is, uh, each uh, row is labeled benign or malicious. Um, it's vector, it's going to vectorize stuff. So one thing it has to store is the way that it turns things into vectors. Uh, so it can do that repeatedly next time. So that's a file that it creates. It's going to train the random forest, save it to disk. And it's going to do a prediction on the test set. And you can see the class 0 is, um, is normal. The class uh, 1 is malicious. And in this case, it has a, a F1 value, which is a numeric, it's, like, it's the harmonic mean of um, you know, precision and recall here. It's pretty good. The, the, the maximum's one. So in this case, it, it correctly identified the malicious data, um, <clears throat> something like 9,000 9, times, and only misclassified at 30. So F1. Um, using some libraries that we have, we can also ask it what are the most influential features here. So. Actually, if you look at this, it's a little funny. This is probably a case of overfitting. It says the most influential feature is if it's Mac OS and the user agent, <laughs> right? So that, that says it's, it's not malicious, um, which probably is a result of like all of our training data being Mac OS, user agent, and the, um, the malicious data not. So this is definitely overfitting. You want to try to get a variety of data sets to avoid this. <clears throat> And we have another script here that it takes in your, um, the things that you made, those artifacts, the featureizers, and the, um, the trained data. Uh, normally, it stores, if you don't give it any options, it'll just store it in a default place like slash temp. Uh, and you, get, you pass it in a log file, and it will print out the logs that it thinks are malicious. All right. So you went from going. Um, you know, found 298 anomalies in 180,000 rows. And so maybe you can actually look at these things, uh, you know, each one of them and say, oh, this is malicious or it's not. Uh, you can also explain things that the classifier does. Um, I wouldn't do this too often because it's like way slow, but uh, uh, it's going to tell you like, I thought this one was malicious because the user agent length is long and the response body length is short, things like that. So it can also kind of like give you a clue as to like why the machine thinks things are malicious, which can also like roll back into helping you like what features should I be looking at, right? <clears throat> so we want to go from maybe axes to bagger 288. Um, what, what would help this out here? You know, more diverse malware samples. Data is always an issue, right? Like can we get more data? Can we make the, the better? Um, better filtering for connectivity checks. So this is just like another feature, right? Um, you might want a warm start. So you might want your algorithm to actually like learn things over time instead of just being static. This is machine learning. So there's, there are ways built in the scikit-learn to um, you know, take the, the train model that you already have and like warm start your new train model if you have new data. So you would load in the old model and the new data and it would give you a new model. <coughs> That's called warm starting. That's built in the scikit. Um, of course, we only do really HTTP logs right now. Uh, we want to have like you know all sorts of logs, DNS logs, things like that. It's pretty easy to do this. It's just a matter of like mapping your columns uh, and then picking out the features. And K class classifier, something I didn't really touch on. Instead of two classes, duck, cat, dog, malicious, not malicious, you can have like benign and then a list of things that it thinks it might be. So I think this might be DNS tunneling using Indigo or whatever. So I think I'm going to skip this. It's just ad, ad, ways to adapt to log sources. You can look at like what you need to do, the steps you need to do to uh, put a new log source into our scripts. Um, so yeah, the takeaways like pandas and scikit-learn. Look into them. They're they're highly active Python projects. Um, they're bringing you know data science and machine learning to the masses the same way that like Grep did back in the day. Uh, uh, so, and they're like really easy to use. I think you, you, can, uh, you can see this with our scripts that we have. 
Um, you know, please download our, our examples, take them, use them, uh, use some other thing, try out new, uh, new classifiers and things like that. Um, you know, security technologists can leverage these tools as uh, black, black or sort of gray boxes, right? It's good to like know what's going on a little bit inside to know that these things are, you know, bad at enumerated types when they are. So you don't pass in an enumerated type and like wreck your results. But you can just take this, use it as a black box in your workflow. Um, you know, use it alongside your other tools that you use. And it, today, like, there's some fancy stuff coming out, deep learning that's a little bit hard to, to, hard to use nowadays. New stuff is coming out every day. But sort of these standard, I'd call them, uh, ML algorithms, implementing them, using them, it's not the long pole in the tent. It's really using them for the right things and for the right reasons. Uh, and, you know, of course, data collection, data cleaning, picking features, that's kind of the hard part, not, not actually the implementation anymore. You can snag our, uh, our library for an example. And um, so I just want to put this up there. I know we're not like shilling stuff or whatever, but like, you know, this is a bunch of stuff that Squirrel's doing, ETL, ETL you, know, you know, we're making models and stuff like that. And kind of the analytics engine, the, the stuff that I've just talked about is, lives in a little corner of this box down here. So we do a lot of that stuff, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of like there's a lot of other stuff you have to do to build a complete hunting platform, right? But it's helpful that SciKit's out there to help you do these things for real. So yeah, thanks. Um, here's mine and David's info and uh, a link to ClearCut, which is just like on David's GitHub, uh, ClearCut. There's two branches because um, iForest didn't come out until 018 in scikit-learn, and that's like not out of beta yet. So I didn't want to like make force every, force beta code on everybody. So like the original, the original branch only has the random forest in it. And it has some it has some pip scripts to like install everything, and then you can check out the iForest branch if you want the iForest stuff. So that's about it. If there's any questions. <laughs>